a priest of the Archdiocese of Detroit. He's been ordained since 1996, and four years ago he founded Acts 29, which equips clergy and lay leaders for this apostolic age that we now live in. He and his co-workers have ministered to more than 2,000 priests and bishops during retreats, convocations, and workshops. And he and Mary Guilfoyle host the podcast, You Were Born For This. And many of his homilies and presentations are available at the Acts 29 website. Father John's a graduate of the University of Michigan. Let's hear University of Michigan graduates out there. Where, what are those boos? I heard some cheers too. He graduated from the Gregorian University in Rome and the Pope John Paul Institute for Studies in Marriage and Family. In his own words, he was born a nothing, he's still a nothing, but he hopes to be a saint one day. So his talk for us today is entitled, Getting Clarity in the Mission. So let's give a special youper welcome to Father John Ricardo. Thanks, Padre. Thanks, man. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Let's pray, shall we? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask for grace right now to be attentive to those things that you desire to say to each of us very personally by name. Help us to hear you. Help us most especially to understand that there is a mission that is entrusted to each and every one of us. That there's something being asked of us. Help us to know that we're not here to just get information. We're here to go out. We're here to do something. We're here to engage with those around us in this world which you love. So fill us with an increase in faith and an increase in hope and most especially an increase in love. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see if these work. So I don't want me ever on that. There we go. All right. So... That face might be familiar. So this is what I want to reflect on with you. And, and I actually, I love this. Like everybody left and went to lunch. No, no, no. But this is what the Lord's saying to me right now. This is exactly what the church looks like. Empty pews. And people out there in the world that we're living in literally dying. And us who are gathered around the Eucharist not having clarity about what we're supposed to be doing. And so I pray that what the Lord will, will do with us right now is grab hold of us and give us what I call clarity on the mission. And I, I find it providential that um, Dr. Sri was just here before because what I think he was talking about is what I would call the mission internally. Virtue and holiness are really important but they're not the mission. And the world is dying because we're not doing what it is that the Lord is asking us to do. So as the Father sent me, Jesus says, so I send you. So that face might be familiar to many of you who grew up around here. That's Archbishop Sample, now in Portland. And I've heard him say a number of times, the church right now has three options. Option one, we can just like mail it in. Forget it. We don't have a chance capitulate. The world's too strong. Option two, build a ghetto. Say, say the heck with them. Let's just hunker down, make sure that we do liturgy well, grow in virtue, grow in holiness, and let them just do whatever. Or option three, we can engage. And there's really only one option. We have to engage. You can't build a ghetto, and we can't capitulate. The question is how to engage. And I would suggest, first of all, we have to have unshakable confidence in Jesus, not in Jonathan Rumi, but in Jesus. So this isn't to be um, overly optimistic. 
Like, I think it's going to get really hard. But who cares? Like, death has been defeated. It can't hold me. Hell has been defeated. It doesn't scare me. So who cares? So let's have confidence in Jesus' lordship. Jesus is not just kind. He is kind, but he's not just kind. David and Lauren were leading us this morning in that song, he has no rival. That's not a line in a song. That's a reality. And Satan knows it. There's no rivalry between Jesus and Satan. He's defeated him. He's bound him. He just hasn't yet destroyed him. So we need confidence, but we also need his heart. That's what we were talking about last night. We've got to make sure that we're engaging with his heart, which is a heart which is eager that all would be saved. God doesn't want some of his children home. He wants all his children home. And maybe there's, there's three places to begin to reflect on getting clarity on the mission. The first might be just to ask ourselves, what was Jesus doing on Easter? Every Sunday that we gather together is a, what we call a little Easter. What's the Lord doing on Easter Sunday? And, and maybe one of the ways to frame that for us is Jesus on Easter Sunday is beginning the recreation of this world which he loves, which I can't stress enough. The goal isn't to get out of here. When the Lord comes back, he's going to make everything new, everything as he created it originally to be. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Lord, at every Mass, we end with these words, right? Ite misa est. She is sent. Who's the she? Who's the she? Yeah, you. Don't answer this out loud. Just ask yourself, do you know what you're sent to do? Third way to begin to think about this, this is a passage which has become very popular over the last number of years. St. Paul says in uh, the fourth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians that God raises up certain people, prophets, apostles, teachers, evangelists, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I would suggest that one of the things, especially as we gather together, the Lord raises up bishops, priests, deacons to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Who are the saints? You are. Don't answer out loud. Just think to yourself, do you know what the ministry is? Th this is what parish ministry looks like for most people who work in a parish. Imagine the, the pastor is at the center of the bottom arrow. And it's just a series of pressures that are coming in. Like the people in the pews are expecting the people who are running the commissions to do all the work. They're expecting the, the, the various, you know, um, pastoral team leaders to do all the work. They're expecting the pastor to do all the work, and he's expecting himself to do all the work. And, and he feels crushed. But what we need to do is we need to find a way to spin the arrows. We need to find a way to make sure that everybody in the pews understands that their task, as they receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus is now animated by the Holy Spirit to be mobilized for mission. I find it unbelievably appropriate that there's a gay pride rally happening right now. And here's why I say it's appropriate. How do you respond to it in the sense of, do you want nothing to do with that? Or would you feel comfortable engaging so as to win them to Jesus? I'm afraid far too many of us want to just build a wall and let them go. But the Lord wants to send us out smack dab into the middle of that with the message of the gospel, with the hope that only he can give. 
with the joy that only he can give, with the truth that only he can give, so that they, they might come to know him too and to experience the transforming love that comes from his total gift of self on the cross. Let me give you a provocative way to think about the mission. C.S. Lewis, famous to, to many of us, he said in a, a little book called Mere Christianity that the story of Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise, and the disguise is flesh. Because Jesus has not just come to show us the Father's love, although he has. And he has not just come to make atonement for our sins, although he has. Jesus has come to go to war. That's why he came. He came to go to war against hell. He came to bind the one he calls the strong man. And he won. Good Friday is not a defeat. Good Friday is a victory. That's what Good Friday is. And Easter Sunday is the confirmation that Good Friday was a victory. And now, Lewis says, he calls us all to engage in a great campaign of sabotage. That's the mission. Go blow things up. Now, lest you get nervous, because we get nervous when we hear language like this, the weapons are truth, goodness, forgiveness, kindness, reconciliation. But in other words, it's almost like the enemy has done, and there's only one enemy. No human being is my enemy as a disciple of Jesus. No human being is my enemy. I'm not allowed as a disciple of Jesus to have a human being as my enemy. Satan and his minions are the enemy. Everybody else is a rebel to be won. Just like I was, just like you were, just like I still can be, just like we all still can be. But the enemy has bent God's creation. That's all he can do. He can't create. He can only destroy and mar and deface. Jesus sends us out, each and every one of us, to bend it back. Remember the song? It's a, it's a bad song. Let us build the city of God. Don't, please don't sing that. You can't build the city of God, but you sure as heck can build for it. And the Lord's blessed every single person here with gifts, natural, supernatural gifts. And he sends us out into all the different places where we live, where we work, where we study, where we engage, where we play. And he wants to use us to bend things back, even at the risk of our lives. And it might cost some of us our lives. So we, we find ways to talk about this in our work in Acts 29. So maybe one of the ways to think would be something like this. Jesus sends us at the end of every single Mass out into the world as his disciples in order to be agents of sabotage and resistance, recreation, restoration, reconciliation, healing, and ambassadors. I want to break those open for you quickly. But I want to talk about two first. So some of us are going to do some of those things, and we do some of those things already. All of us are called to do two things. And the first, we, we reflected, Father Luke last night talked a little bit about it. The first is, every single one of us is sent out to be in agonizing prayer on behalf of the world. And the foundational reason for this is because every single one of us by baptism is a priest. And I don't think most of us know what that means. I don't think most women even know they're priests. Before I was this kind of priest, I was that kind of priest. And yes, as Father Luke mentioned last night, priests offer sacrifice. They do something even more fundamental, I would suggest. Priests have access. Somebody pull out your phone right now. Try to call the governor. Go ahead. You think you'll get through? Call the president. 
Think you'll get through? Call your pastor. Think you'll get through? Some of you are nodding your heads. You know him. Call your doctor. Think you'll get through? Probably not. You can talk to God anytime you want. Anytime you want. We take that absolutely for granted. In the Old Testament, one guy, once a year, with a rope tied around his waist in case he died, had access to God. You can talk to God anytime you want. And we're supposed to go before the Father in agonizing prayer on behalf of the world. I go in agony before God about the world. I don't often go in agonizing prayer to God on behalf of the world. I do a lot of complaining to God about the world. I don't go and bring a lot of people before the Father in prayer. I, Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, he's the abbot of uh, a Benedictine monastery in Oregon. He says, it's the priest's work. He's not talking about the ordained. It's all of us. It's the priest's work to bring another before God in prayer. So that's the first mission that belongs to every single one of us. It could be Ukraine. It could be the victims of human trafficking. It could be your grandson. It could be the person across the street who's problematic. Whoever it is, the Lord grants us access to him so as to pray. And the second mission that he gives to all of us is, I think, the most difficult passage in all of Scripture. When St. Paul says, I fill up in my own flesh what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. What in the world is lacking in the sufferings of Christ? One thing. My participation in it. And yours. It's not a question of if I'm going to suffer. It's just a question of when and how. And when we suffer, we can do one of two things. We can complain, which is what I do. Or we can say, Lord, I would rather not have this. Father Luke talked about offering it up. I hate that expression. I find it very passive. Pope Benedict likes it, so it's got to be right. I prefer the expression to actively unite it to the cross. In other words, to say to him, Lord, I would rather not have this, but I have this. So I unite it to your cross for these people for this situation. And I trust that just as the cross was not in vain, my suffering is not in vain, even if I don't understand how you're using it right now. A friend of mine used to work with Mother Teresa. He went with her one time into a hospital. There were two brothers who were suffering intensely from cancer. She walked in. She pointed to one. She says, you take Russia and you take China. And then she walked out. Like, that's your mission. Don't waste this. Use it. Is it romantic? Absolutely not. Does it change things? You better believe it. If we'd been there on that day we call Good Friday and seen Jesus hanging naked on a cross, we would have said, what in the world is ever going to come of this? Well, the redemption of the world came from that. The defeat of death and hell and sin and Satan came from that. Those of you who are suffering right now, and there are many in this place right now who are suffering, trust it is not in vain and united to his cross. Let me break open these words. So the Lord sends us out at every Mass into the world in order to be agents of sabotage and resistance. Now, sabotage, you might know, is, is not a biblical word. It's a French word. The Bible's not written in French. Sabotage is defined as the deliberate attempt to damage, destroy, or hinder a cause or activity as by civilians or enemy agents in a time of war. I would love to tell you that we're not in a time of war, but we are. We have been ever since our first parents sold us into slavery. Just remember who the enemy is. The enemy is the enemy, period. Not another political party, not another race, not another gender, not the rich people, not northern Michigan, not Michigan Tech, not even Lake Superior State. Right? The enemy is hell. But 
though sabotage isn't a biblical word, resistance is, and resistance is a synonym to sabotage. Resistance is defined as to take action in opposition to. Peter talks about this in his first letter. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. I used to read that passage and think, Peter's telling me, when temptation comes, don't cave. And there's truth to that. But it means more than that. It means oppose him. Fight him. Let me give you an example of someone who did that. December 1st, 1955, a woman was coming home from work. She was taking the bus because she took the bus every morning to work and she took the bus every evening home from work. She was seated in the 11th row because the first 10 rows were reserved for white people and she wasn't white. First 10 rows quickly filled up. The bus driver told her to move back. She didn't move back. Bus driver commanded her to move back. She didn't move back. Bus driver stopped the bus, called the police. They arrested her and they officially charged her with resisting the orders of a bus driver. And they threw her in prison. Her name? Rosa Parks. So began the civil rights movement in the United States. So brought into the limelight a young pastor who most of the world had never heard of named Martin Luther King Jr. I don't know a major city in the country that doesn't have a street named after Rosa Parks now. Unfortunately, what most people don't know is that Rosa Parks was a serious disciple of Jesus. This is what she said. She says, I instantly felt God give me the strength to endure whatever would happen next. God's peace flooded my soul and my fear melted away. All people, all people, all people are equal in the eyes of God. I was going to live like a free person. I felt the Lord would give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. God did away with all my fear. It was time for someone to stand up, or in my case, sit down. See, this is a woman who understands that it is a demonic idea from the pit of hell that because of the pigmentation of some people's skin, they are either greater or lesser than other people. And it should be resisted and opposed with everything we have. And she did. So some of us he sends out to be agents of resistance. Others of us he sends out to be agents of recreation. St. Paul says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. This is extraordinary news, right? Like so often we feel about ourselves this is who I am. This is how I'm always going to be. I'm just stuck. That's an absolute lie. God recreates over and over and over and over again. Nobody's stuck. Let me give you an example of one of these agents. This woman should be a poster child for this age. She was an atheist, a communist, an anarchist, alcoholic, had several affairs, had an abortion, Two times she tried to take her life, and in December of 1927, Dorothy Day became Catholic. I don't know what you know about Dorothy Day. I don't know a more disturbing person in my life than Dorothy Day, personally. People who met her said afterwards, what just happened? I think if she and I sat down, we would go rounds on like almost every issue, and she would win. Like on almost every issue. She'd just turn the Bible around, point to the Sermon on the Mount, and say, but Father Jesus said this. And I would be like, duh. Colonel George once said about Dorothy Day, not everybody's called to be a pacifist, like she was, but Dorothy Day was a witness of how the world should be and how one day it will be. And after she experienced recreation in her own life, 
she then went to the margins and gave her life so as to help recreate those who felt discarded by the culture. She was a lot like this other woman who likewise went to the margins and just served to help recreate those who felt disposable, unseen, and unloved. So some of us he sends out to be agents of recreation. Others of us he sends out to be agents of restoration. So recreation has to do with with people getting remade. Restoration has something to do with like systems or structures. Could be athletics, entertainment, politics, medicine, you name it. Getting brought back into harmony with how God created them to be. I've always loved this passage in the Gospel of John. It's Easter Sunday. Magdalene's at the tomb. Hasn't met Jesus yet that she knows. She turns around. Jesus is standing there. She thinks he's the gardener, right? Remember that? She's right. He is the gardener. He's the new Adam. He's beginning the recreation of this world which he loves. And the Lord sends some of us into different spheres of life to recreate them. Here's an example of a man who did that. Some of us are old enough to remember Chuck Colson in Watergate. Colson was Nixon's hatchet man. He was an attorney, a Marine, an atheist. He once famously said, I'd throw my grandmother under the bus to get the president reelected. This is a bad man. Then he meets Jesus. Then he goes to prison. And while he's in prison, he looks around and he goes, uh, I don't think this is working. Like, I don't think our prison system's doing what we created it to do. This is what he said. He says, when I was in prison, I saw the absolute futility of the prison system. There's no way you can take a bunch of criminals, stick them in a dorm, where they sit around at night comparing the crimes they committed and how they're going to do it next time and expect to rehabilitate them. It's demeaning, he said. It's demoralizing. It doesn't give people aspirations to do the right thing. It almost encourages them to do the wrong thing. So I got out of prison, and I realized this isn't working. And what's he do? He starts a ministry called Prison Fellowship, which is now in over 100 countries around the world, pours itself out like crazy, especially for those on death row, and it helps not only to give hope, and transformation to the inmates, but to do something about the system, which has been bent in many places, and he's trying to bend it back. Get a load of this mission statement. Prison Fellowship works to restore America's criminal justice system and those it affects. We help men and women replace the cycle of brokenness that landed them in prison. We advocate for justice reform and activate grassroots networks to do the same. We equip wardens to bring restorative change to their facilities. We care for prisoners' families and help strengthen the bond between children and their parents who are behind bars. We call the church to lead the way in caring for those impacted by the criminal justice system. We do it all from a biblical worldview. I got a friend of mine, he's a major college football coach. I heard him say recently, I spent the first half of my life living for me. I'm not living for me anymore. I'm living for God. I'm living for my family. And I'm living for the kids I coach. He's trying to be an agent of restoration. Sports is a wonderful thing can be, but it can easily be bent and twisted and defaced to make it all about winning and all about money and all about me. He's trying to bend it back and to form young men and all those that they're going to impact so as to make it more in accord with how God created it to be. He sends us out to be agents of reconciliation, and brothers and sisters, do we need desperately to be these right now. This country has no hope apart from God. 
It has no hope apart from Jesus, which means you and I have leading roles, and especially you who are laymen and women. We are literally at each other's throats. But the church should know, like nobody knows, that what God does best is take people who used to hate each other and not make it possible for them to tolerate each other, but for them to love each other, acknowledge each other as brothers and sisters, and to lay down their lives for each other. If we don't do this in our country, I don't know what happens. If we do, then God can bring real unity. But only God can bring unity. Paul knew this. Paul says, He himself is our peace, Jesus, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's not a metaphor for Paul or an image in the temple in Jerusalem that Steve was talking about this morning, there was a wall, a real wall, which separated from Jews from Gentiles, and on the wall was inscribed, a Gentile who passes this spot is responsible for his own death. These people hated each other until they met Jesus. And then they laid down their lives for each other. And it was the witness of that, in large part, which won so many people to the church. I'll tell you the most amazing, extraordinary story of this I've ever heard. Anybody been to Auschwitz? I've been there three times. I don't ever want to go again. It's hell on earth. The commandant of Auschwitz was a Catholic, raised in a very, very rigid family. When he was a young boy, junior high, he went to confession. He thought the priest broke the seal. He didn't, but he thought he did because his parents found out something that he didn't know how they could find out unless the priest told him. And he made a decision to never trust a Catholic priest again, left the church. Shortly thereafter, he was recruited by Heinrich Himmler into the SS. Himmler groomed him to be a commandant. He started his career in Dachau. Went to another camp, and then became the commandant of Auschwitz from 1940 to 43, and again for a little bit in 1945. When they caught him, he was the only Nazi war criminal who confessed that he was responsible for people's deaths. He said, I am personally responsible for two and a half million people's deaths. He wasn't repentant. He just acknowledged it. One of the first things the Nazis did when they went into a town is they arrested all those who were the leaders of thought, which usually meant university people and clergy. And so they went into the Jesuit house in Krakow. They arrested all the priests in the house, except for the guy in the left, a, a priest named Father Vladislav Lone. He was the he was the superior in the house. He was just like gone that day. I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't there. He came home and nobody's there. He says, where'd the brothers go? And the neighbor says, well, they just arrested them. They took them to Auschwitz. So this guy breaks into Auschwitz. Turns himself into the guards. They say, what are you doing here? He says, you arrested my brothers. I want to die with them. They took him to the commandant. The commandant looks at him and says, why are you here? He says, you arrested my brothers. I want to die with him. The commandant looks at him and says, you are crazy. Get out of here. And he kicks him out of Auschwitz. They both survive the war. The British capture the commandant, Rudolf Haas. They beat him badly. They bring him to Nuremberg where he's tried and then in Nuremberg, they make the decision to send all the Nazi war criminals who are going to be condemned to death back to the countries where they committed the crime. So he goes back to Poland. He's not afraid of dying. He knows he's going to die. He's afraid of getting tortured because he's going back to Poland. 
So they put him in a prison in a little town called Vadovice. Anybody know this town? This is where John Paul's from. It just happened to be where John Paul's from. He's in a little prison around the corner from that. That's the church where John Paul was baptized in. And he's expecting to be beaten. Most of the guards have tattoos, which means they were in Auschwitz. That's where they tattooed people. They don't beat him. They actually treat him really kindly. And he's, he's floored. He's weeks away from being executed. And as he's receiving the kindness of these men, this guy who was known as the animal when he was in Auschwitz because he never showed emotion when he was torturing people, slowly has his heart begin to crack. And one day, from this church, he hears bells ringing. The day just happened to be Good Friday. And he asked the guards if he could see a priest. They couldn't find one that spoke German. They were all dead. And he remembers the name of the man that he kicked out of Auschwitz. And he writes down Father Vladislav Lone's name, and he gives it to the guards, and he says, find that man. Well, that man just happened to be praying at that moment in front of the image of divine mercy. And so they found that man. And Father Vladislav Lone, who had been kicked out of Auschwitz by the commandant, who had killed not only his brothers, but two and a half million other people, walks into the cell where this man is. And just like Ananias greeted Saul, who had been killing Christians, Lone looks at him and says, Rudolph, my brother. And he hears his confession. And he brings him back into the church. And the next day he returns with the Eucharist. And one of the guards said, and Father Vladislav Lone said later in his life, never in my life have I seen anyone receive Jesus the way that man did. And the next week he was hung. The Lord sends all of us out into the world to be agents of reconciliation. He sends us out to be agents of healing. Jesus says, not just to the 72, but to every one of us here right now, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it. That's a command in Greek. I command you, he says, to heal the sick, spiritually, emotionally, physically, however it might be. And the most extraordinary example of that I've ever seen is my mom and dad. My mom and dad are both gone now. They were married August 5th, 1950. They were married for 66 years. That's their wedding picture on the left. I think that's their 40th anniversary on the right. My dad came from a dirt poor Italian Catholic immigrant family. Upstate New York, my mom was as wasp as you can be. She grew up in Gross Point. She had three older brothers. She was the only daughter. Her dad, my grandfather, was her hero. He was the most intimidating man I've ever met in my life. Self-made man, stud athlete. He owned the Detroit Lions when they won. <laughs> Tells you how long ago that was. He was her hero until one day her brothers showed up at her door when she was in college. And they told her that every day, apparently, for a number of weeks, my grandfather was going to work. And as he would go to work, he'd, he'd just put like a, a, an extra shirt on underneath his jacket. When it was a little bit cooler, like today, he'd put an extra sweater on underneath his jacket. And he did this day after day, week after week, until one day my grandmother went into the bedroom, opened up the closet doors, and there were no clothes. My grandfather walked out on my mom and her mom. He was having an affair with his secretary. My mom went ballistic. 
Some of you know this pain. She didn't talk to my grandfather for 10 years, didn't invite him to the wedding, sent every card that he sent her back unopened, sent every gift that he sent her back unopened. They died reconciled, thanks be to God, that's another story. But when my dad met my mom, he knew this. He knew that behind the facade of, a, of an intelligent, attractive, athletic woman was in fact an incredibly broken heart. She felt rejected, disposable, unloved, unseen, unnoticed. And he knew enough about the sacrament of marriage to know that God had brought him into her life to heal that. It's a great line. We sang it last night in the closing song at Mass. It's the Anima Christi prayer. The line is, within your wounds, hide me. That doesn't mean protect me, Lord, from all that's going on. It means wherever your body's hurting, place me. Insert me into the wound, Lord, so that by your grace, somehow I can be a means to heal it. Those of you who are married, please, God, you know each other's lives, but not so you can push each other's buttons. You know each other's lives so that God can use you as a means to heal the wounds that you have. And we all have wounds. Tragically, most of us don't feel safe enough to share the real wounds. And I can tell you story after story after story of how God used my dad to heal this. I'll just tell you how it ended. When my mom died, or my dad died, he, he died first. We were sitting in the back of the church. We're about to process in for the funeral. It's just me, my siblings, some of the other priests who were there. And my mom was in her wheelchair. She was close to death herself at that time. And she wheeled herself up to my dad's casket. And she said the most amazing thing I've ever heard any human being say to another human being. She just grabbed his hand, his like ice cold, rock hard hand, and looked at him. And loud enough that I could hear, said this. Honey, because of you, I know who God is. I know I'm not rejected. I'm not discarded. I'm not disposable. I'm not unloved. I know I matter. I know I'm worth fighting for. I know I'm worth dying for. You made the invisible visible. And my life's forever different. Please, God, your spouse, if you go first, will say that to you. If you're married, this is the mission. Ask him today, Lord, how do you want to use me to heal my husband or to heal my wife? What wound do you want to place me inside of so that they will experience the regenerative power that only comes from you? but which I have the incredible privilege of being able to make manifest. And finally, he sends us out to be ambassadors. St. Paul says, all this, all this, like everything, right, is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, all of us, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, as it were, making his appeal through us. I don't know if you've ever lived in another country, but if you ever have, and you've ever spent any time at an embassy, it gives you a very different understanding of this passage. 
This is one of the most powerful ways I know of to think of the church. The church is an embassy. What's an embassy? An embassy is the headquarters of a government serving in a foreign country. That's the church. With the kingdom of God right here in enemy-occupied territory. It's led by an ambassador who's the representative of the other country's leader. In an ultimate sense, in Marquette, that's the bishop. By extension, it's his brothers who serve as priests. But it's all of us. We're all representatives of the other country's leader. We're not subject to the laws of the host country. What are the laws of our host country? Envy, anger, resentment, bitterness, division, slander, lust. You name it. I'm not subject to those anymore. Neither are you. I still sin all the time. So do you. But I don't have to. Like It doesn't have any power over me. And we offer asylum and extradition or in protect, protection from arrest and extradition. This is what the church is supposed to be. And the best example of this I've ever seen is that guy. I was privileged to live in Rome for a number of years in the early 90s. The Cardinal Archbishop of Detroit used to come over to, Detroit, to Rome a lot, which meant we went to see John Paul a lot. Like, I don't know how many times I met John Paul. We got so many invitations, we started saying no, which is just absurd to think about right now. And I don't know if you ever met John Paul, if you ever saw him on TV. When, this has to be like one of the ten greatest people who ever lived. And the experience of meeting him was rather overwhelming. He didn't say this, but this is this is how I felt anyway when I met him. It was almost as if he looked at you and he said, son, let's, let's just be honest. Um, you don't have anywhere near the gifts that I have. <laughs> but you can still be great, so be great. And that's what it was like to meet him. Like you just felt like, like someone was pulling up your shoulders, like stand up straight, like go do something with your life. Like be a hero, be great. And when John Paul was elected at the first Mass, he celebrated, this is what he said. This is 1978. Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to welcome Christ and accept his power. Do not be afraid, those words which have become so synonymous with him. Open wide the doors for Christ to his saving power. Here's all the agents played out. Open the boundaries of states economic and political systems, the vast fields of culture, civilization and development. In other words, go remake everything you can with the power of the gospel. Do not be afraid. Christ knows what is in man. He alone knows it. So often today, man doesn't know what's within him, in the depths of his mind, in his heart. So often he's uncertain about the meaning of his life on this earth. He's assailed by doubt, a doubt which turns into despair, which is rampant right now. We ask you, therefore, we beg you with humility and trust, let Christ speak to man. He alone has the words of life, of eternal life. St. Paul says, God, as it were, is making his appeal through you and through me. What's the appeal? I think it's this. You can defect. You don't have to live under the laws of anger and lust and hatred and unforgiveness and resentment and greed and all the things that are afflicting us. In other words, people are supposed to walk into our parishes. Would that this were true. Maybe it is in Marquette. It isn't in most of the country. Who don't belong to our parishes and look at us and go, huh, well, I'll be. This is real. These people get it. Here's people who have nothing in common. Nothing except him. They know they owe everything to him. And because of him, they see each other as brother and sister. And they're just radically sold out for him. And they're trying to let him conform him or them to himself. 
and they're trying to lay down their lives for each other. If people saw that, there would be lines to get into our churches. The church is supposed to be immensely threatening and attractive all at the same time. I fear we're neither. Attractive to those who are longing for real unity. The unity only God can give. And threatening to those who will not bend their knee to Jesus. One author says this about the church. He says, Paul saw the church as a, a microcosmos, a little world, not an alternative to the present one, not an escapist country cottage for those tired of city life, as the prototype of what was to come. That's why unity and holiness mattered. And because this microcosmos was there in the world, it was designed to function like a beacon, a light in a dark place, as Jesus had said, the new way of being human, the new way in which philosophy, religion, politics were all scooped up together and transcended in a renewed Jewish messianic way of life was bound to be threatening to those who live by other philosophies, religions, and political arrangements. Hence, the inevitability of suffering. But it was also supposed in equal measure to be compellingly attractive. May that be so in our parishes, people. St. Joan of Arc is one of our heroes in our work. Outside of the Blessed Virgin Mary, if there's a greater woman who's ever lived than her, I don't know who it is. To do what she did at the time that she did, at the age that she did, is unthinkable. And you might know St. Joan of Arc once was asked as she began the mission which God had uniquely given to her, aren't you afraid? And she says, no. No, I'm not afraid. God's with me. I was born for this. So were you. And so were you. And so were you. And so was every single person in this arena right now. We were born for this time in history. And God has placed into each and every one of us very particular gifts, and He's given us a mission. And he's begging us to go. We're supposed to be catapulted out of every mass to go remake this world. I'll leave you with these words. A friend of ours wrote this. He says, in the high stakes drama all around us, we've each been given a part to play, one that bears our name and no one else's. We each have the mercy of God to receive, a self to put to death, a kingdom to gain, a battle to fight and spiritual enemies to slay. Spiritual enemies to slay. Comrades to, raid, to aid. Rebels to win over. The ancient battle rages all around us. The adventure that we were born for beckons. I beg you all throughout the remainder of this day and all throughout the days ahead, Beg the Lord, Lord, what's the mission? Don't let me capitulate. Don't let me build a ghetto. Send me. Use me. However you want, use me. The mission of the church doesn't happen in here. The mission of the church happens out there. And people are dying, literally, because they don't know him. Mary's on our team. She often says, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be rescued. Rescued from futility, from anxiety, from hopelessness, from despair, from Satan's grip, from the fear of death. But rescued people go and rescue other people. May that be true of each and every one of us. May we spend the rest of our lives animated by the Holy Spirit, doing everything we can to rescue those who are now as you and I once were. Amen. Amen.